Good morning and welcome to the Rapid City Planning Commission meeting for December 10th, 2020. If any member of the audience wishes to speak to an item on the Planning Commission agenda today, please fill out a speaker request form that you can find along the table on the left wall and hand it to staff once you've filled it out. At this time, I would also like to ask that if any member of the audience has a cell phone or other electronic device that you either turn it off or turn the ringer to silent. If you need to take a call, please step out to the hallway so the meeting is not disrupted. Items one through four have been placed on the consent calendar today and may be approved as a group. Action will be taken on all consent items in accordance with staff's recommendation by a single vote. Any item may be removed from the consent calendar by any planning commissioner, staff member, or audience member for separate consideration at this time. The findings of this planning commission are recommendations to the city council. The city council will make the final decision with the exception of the following item. Item 4, 20PD032. The Rapid City Planning Commission's actions on this item are final unless any party appeals that decision to the Rapid City Council. All appeals must be submitted in writing to the Department of Community Development by close of business on the seventh full calendar day following action by the Planning Commission. Are there any items one through four that staff would like removed? Thank you. And any items one through four that any Planning Commissioner would like removed? I would like further discussion on item three. Take that off the consent calendar. Okay. And any items one, two, or four that any audience member would like removed for separate consideration? The chair would then entertain a motion to approve items one, two, and four in accordance with staff's recommendation. Mike Gallagher made the motion. Is there a second? Vince seconded that motion. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item number three. Even if you might uh, pose your questions or. Yes, thank you. With regard to item number three, I'm. Uh, Assuming that there's, or does the issue of uh, sales tax revenue uh, to the city come, uh, is, is that part of the discussion on de-annexation? The other questions, I guess, where there's, there, it's a little unclear what buildings are on this particular lot and whether they're separate buildings or is uh, the, uh, what's been, laid out in our notes here is that all in one building i guess that's a good question i can clarify both of those items the graphic on the screen shows the portion of the property that is to be de-annexed there was a revision to this staff report that went out um, earlier this week to clarify that boundary recently this property was platted into two lots and so the portion that you see highlighted there is the new um, lot b and that is the only portion to be de-annexed, it's approximately 1.17 acres in size. Um, so that particular portion of uh, property currently has no structural development on it, it's just a parking lot and undeveloped land. Um, so if that addresses the second part of your question. And then the first part of the question um, was about kind of the economic impact of this de-annexation. Uh, contingent, uh, one of the stipulations for approval of this item is that the council enter into an agreement with the property owners and the city of Box Elder, so the three parties involved. And um, one of the items in that agreement is that the developer is going to agree that all water park ticket points of, stale, points of sale remain in the city limits and that the developer not intentionally relocate. So that ensures that sales tax that's currently be collected and being directed and collected for the city uh, remains so. So, so does this, uh, I, I guess the division between the two cities there, I know there's a, quite a bit of common boundary between Box Elder and Rapid City in this location. Is, are, we, are, we, uh, move, are we making kind of a jagged line between the two or is there a straight line between the two cities? Um, it is sort of a jagged line. The city of Box Elder and the city of Rapid City butt up to one another in this area in general. Uh, this lot B that will be de-annexed will then be 
annexed into the city of Box Elder. So essentially this new lot line between lot A and lot B is the boundary between Rapid City and Box Elder. Vicki, uh, we can't hear you. Oh, I can. The Where you see the yellowish orange line up there, um, that's the, the current boundary. And so, um, let's see. And I, I, not sure I understood that there was a Perkin, the Perkins is on this lot. It is not. The it's Perkins, not. the Perkins is right here. This will remain in the city limits. And the city limits line currently. Thank you. The city limits line currently goes like this. It currently envelops this area. If the de-annexation is approved, it'll come here. So the Watiki Water Park, the Fairfield Inn, and the Perkins remain in the city limits. And the, the reason for the, the de-annexation um, is because there's a proposed expansion to this development. The owners of the property are going to expand the water park into this property and this property here, which is currently in the Box Elder city limits. If that helps clarify. Wade, do you have something to add to this one? Yeah, I just wanted to weigh in on the, the sales tax issue. Um, there's really, we're somewhat at the mercy of the Department of Revenue on that. Um, and I've been uh, talking with Paul Bradsky about this. We've kind of, we've gone back and forth a little on, on the language for this agreement. Um, basically, we're trying to to keep sales tax in Rapid City as best we can, but there's not really a guarantee. So we can put it in the agreement that they're not, you know, they're not gonna intentionally try to move all sales outside of the city of Rapid City, but there's, the way the boundary lines go through, it kind of cuts through the Watiki building right now, and so there's part of it, like the restaurant is in Box Elder, but the water park is in Rapid City, and so it's a little bit of a, it's a tough issue to handle, especially between us when there's the Department of Revenue that comes in and has the final say that sales made for this or within this part of the building are Rapid City sales and these are Box Elder sales. So I just wanted to say, it's not really a clarification, I guess, but make it as clear as mud, but um, there is another sort of influence in that area. So we're kind of doing the most we can with what we have as regard to sales tax. Vicki? Just a little explanation as to why this even came about. They're going to be doing an expansion to the Watiki Water Park in this area that's being de-annexed, and Box Elder is going to be providing services to that portion. Um, and similarly, if it would have been a reverse and they would have needed our utilities, we would have had them join the city limits. So in looking at the logistics of that, it made sense. Box Elder's gonna serve that new expansion. We will continue to serve what's there. Currently, ticket sales is on our side and we're hoping it stays that way. I, I, just one comment, I guess uh, I do appreciate the, the cooperation, I guess, between Box Elder and, and Rapid City. And I know that's, that little area can get a little complicated, but I'm glad to see the two cities are cooperating and getting along. Karen? I guess just to sort of follow up just a little bit. So the sales are, are in the Rapid City boundary, but the park is in the Box Elder boundary. And the Box Elder is going to take care of all the maintenance and do all the, give them the water and do all that kind of thing. Down the road, Wade, and I understand this is, like you said, kind of muddy, but down the road, it seems to me that if Box Elder is doing all the work and stuff, they'd, they're going to eventually want to have the ticket sales too. Would you think that, or is that not an issue at this point? So the, the water park currently is in Rapid City. And so I think the way, and the way uh, Mr. Bradsky explained this, I think is most, most all of the park admission sales are credited towards Rapid City. There are some 
you can buy a water park ticket in the La Quinta, which is in Box Elder. And I think that might go towards Box Elder. But it's, it's a complex issue, and I'm not sure that there's a real logical reason for the way they've decided, because the, the way the line cuts through the, not the middle of the building, but kind of the edge where the restaurant, the sliders, is in Box Elder, but the water park part is in. So some of the sales are actually in Box Elder, but it's for the water park in Rapid City, and so they credit those towards Rapid City. So I think we're a little bit left to the interpretation of the Department of Revenue on how they want to divvy that up. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I, I do understand. I just thought if they were expanding the, the water park and more of it would be in Box Elder, that would give them more incentive to say, wait a minute, it's in the well, area. I definitely think it, it opens up the possibility that, you know, you want to say half and half or, you know, figure out the square footage and make a percentage. I, I think that's probably a, a possibility, but. Okay. Well, I understand the idea for the de-annexation. So that's, I mean, that's probably what should be done. So mm -hmm. thank you. I appreciate it. Yep. Vince. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so uh, from what I'm hearing, uh, there's always a possibility that this could change. And is that through the Department of Revenue or does it come back to zoning planning? As far as the sales tax, yes, um, yeah. Ultimately, they uh, they did an audit on this at some point in time. I can't tell you when. Several years ago, and they decided that you know these sales for this um, part of the business were in Box Elder. These sales for this part were in Rapid City, and so I think you know ultimately they are the people who decide how the how the sales tax is applied and, and where it's where it's applied, where it's remitted to. So um, I don't know that it, it there's not a lot that the city can do. Um, I suppose that there's a, you know if we had a, a disagreement in interpretation, there's probably a possibility for legal action. I don't know that we would pursue that, but okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments on item three? Okay. Karen made the motion to approve item number three and Mike Gallagher seconded that motion. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item number five. Uh, morning, everybody. Um, item number five is a conditional use permit for on-sale liquor at uh, 516 and 518 Mount Rushmore Road. It was formerly a bakery. Uh, now the on-sale liquor is being proposed in conjunction with a proposed Japanese-style restaurant that does mostly lunch and dinner. I have the letter of intent here. I don't know if you can read it, but um, the highlights here are that uh, it's going to be a small Japanese-themed restaurant uh, called Bokujo Ramen. It'll sell beer and wine to accompany the food. Uh, they anticipate that 20% of the revenue will come from the sale of beer and wine at a max. And uh, anticipated hours of operation are Wednesday through Sunday, um, open for lunch and dinner, but no later than 11 p.m. Um, and capacity will be around 40 in the restaurant. Um, so here is the aerial shot. Uh, in this property on the corner of St. Joe's and Mount Rushmore. Uh, Boku Joe will go sort of in the top left corner of that building there. Um, right now it's zoned as Central Business District and Future Land Use Plan has that property as downtown. Um, here on the transportation plan you can see that both Mount Rushmore and St. Joe's are principal arterial but because there's no off-street parking proposed since it's downtown uh, there's no anticipated transportation impacts. Um, this is the floor plan of, of what they're proposing there. So that's the, the space in the larger building that they're going to be occupying. Um, 
And then uh, these are the site photos. So that's the storefront. Um, to the left is Black Hills Works Foundation there. And then to the right is uh, nothing until you get to St. Saint, Saint Joe's. There's no storefront there. Um, this is a shot from across the street looking to the north of Mount Rushmore Road. So you can see the hotel there. Um, and then here's to the south. And like I said, there's the intersection with St. Joe's and Mount Rushmore. Um, and there's on-street parking on St. Joe's there uh, to the, if you were to go up that street to the left. Um, and then this is a proof that the conditional use permit notice has been posted. Um, it just wasn't visible in the first picture because it was in a different window, not visible from where I took the photos. Uh, so staff recommends approval for this item. Um, it's on non-consent because Planning Commission asked that all on-sale liquors be non-consent, but uh, we approve, we have recommend approval with stipulations. And um, the applicant is here today, um, Brooke, if you have any questions for her. Thank you. Any questions or comments on this one? Haven? Excuse me, the, just for my clarification, the, the drawing here shows that the, the entire building there, which goes to St. Joe, uh, but I understand that the, 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 this application is only for that northwest corner up on the, along the alley on Mount Rushmore Road? Um, yeah, so the, the unit within that larger building there is, is um, 516 and 518 is in the top left corner, but it's not the whole building that's applied for the... Mr. Chair? Okay. Just a point of clarification. The reason this graphic shows the whole building is the intent is to show you the boundaries of the legal description and the legally described property includes the entire structure. And that's why this graphic in yellow shows the entire building instead of just the suite that's being proposed for the restaurant. Other questions on item five from the commission? All right, Mike made the motion to approve item number five with staff stipulations and Eric Heikus seconded that motion. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item number six, Patsy. Good morning. This is an application to create a new tax increment district located between East North Street and Elkvale and Eglin and Highway 44. It's marked in the uh, red boundary. I've also included the boundary of the Rapid Valley Sanitary District because there is about an 80 acre uh, portion that's within Rapid Valley's um, sanitary district. So I wanted to make sure that you had that information. Uh, the purpose of this district is to extend two uh, water mains between East Philadelphia at Anamosa over to Elkvale where you see that little white dot which is generally the uh, reservoir. Those two water lines will extend through Anamosa Street and cross and connect right there at Elkvale where the mains exist. We also are going to get four regional detention ponds constructed. We're going to extend a 12-inch water main in Mickelson Drive where there is nothing between the terminus of Mickelson Drive right now connecting to East Anamosa Street. Um, there will be a portion of Mickelson Drive that's um, actually paved uh, right near Western Dakota Tech. And then as part of the grading projects, there's going to be some power line and private utilities relocated within East Anamosa, Mickelson Drive, and North Valley Drive. So here's a picture of the master plan that shows um, the public improvements. And I'm just going to go through phase one, which is uh, scheduled to begin in 2021-2022. We've got East Anamosa Street. That came in with um, the yellow boundary that you see there. Um, that's the first phase of the two water lines. You can see the 16-inch water line is on the north and the 20-inch water line is on the south. 
Um, the reason we need two water mains is because we, uh, we have a convergence of both the high um, water pressure level and the low um, level um, zone, and so we've got to have those two water lines in there to make it work. And the real critical piece of um, this particular project is extending those two water lines that, and make them connect all the way over to Elkvale. Um, this is one of the reasons that this piece of property has been undeveloped for so many years is because we don't have those two water lines in there. North Valley Drive, um, there'll be paving about 300 feet on each side of the center line. Uh, excuse me, just grading. Um, we've got some uh, pretty good terrain right in that area, so they're going to um, provide, we're gonna, the TIF will provide some funding for that grading and relocating those utilities as necessary. In the purple boundary there, we've got the Mickelson Drive um, connection. And there's, a, again, there's a small portion, about 400 feet, that's unpaved. We're going to get that paved. And then that uh, water main extension from the current terminus right there at Western Dakota Tech extending north to connect to um, those two new mains that go east and west. We're going to get three detention ponds in phase one. Um, those are located in a white boundary. You can see those. And then the regional booster station, um, the developers identified um, that he will provide funding for the booster station for a feasibility study for um, the land for designing construction if the feasibility study determines that the booster station needs to be located inside this TIF boundary. Currently the proposal is um, east of Elkvale where the uh, reservoir is now. It's just off the screen to the right. Um, so if that feasibility study does determine that um, the booster station can be located inside the boundary, then the developer will provide funding to the city for the, the study itself, designing construction funding, and then also construction dollars, and the city will oversee that project. So the total uh, construction dollars in phase one is $9.7 million. Professional and contingency and necessary and convenient costs at about 10% each. And then total of uh, phase one is 11.1 .1 million. And if you like a, a chart. I don't know why that marker is there, but that's right. And so then phase two will occur about 24, 25, and that is um, those construction projects are located east of North Valley Drive. We have the water mains in East Anamosa Street that are about $3 million. And then we have the last regional detention pond located um, kind of in the middle of Anamosa Street there. Phase two will be $3.4 million with contingencies and design at um, with a total of 4.1 million and so again one of the uh, critical pieces is to make sure that we get the entire two water mains between East Philadelphia over to Elkville connected and so the total of this particular TIF is about 28.8 million again there's a spreadsheet uh, looking thing for you 4.1 for phase for the capital costs and then interest and financing is 29. I had a little bit uh, lower interest rate and I'll show you why. But just to identify some of the specific land uses in here, we've got some industrial uses on the north. We've got retail and office uses um, near Elkville. We've got a mobile home park with 118 units that uh, the roads are already uh, constructed and they've got some a couple units on site already. We've got the Tallgrass Apartments at 607 units. We've got some additional apartments um, just off Valley Drive. The uh, single family homes are average 100 to $250,000 within this um, particular proposal. We've also got some tiny homes that they have proposed right there by Mickelson. And so the estimated revenue in 2024 um, the incremental revenue is about $1.8 million with per year starting about 2024. So here are some on-site views that um, I took. 
this is a view of uh, East Philadelphia looking to the east. You can see East Philadelphia already con connects. Um, you can sort of see a couple of those uh, manufactured homes that um, are, a couple of them are on site to the right, a couple of them are off site to the left. Then we've got a view of the uh, tall grass apartments that are under construction. Another view um, of the road that extends from Philadelphia south with a couple single family homes that are already um, under construction. This is a view looking to the west along Philadelphia Street. You can see all of the new homes on the south side of the road and the apartments on the right. And then another view of the second apartment structure that um, they are working on as well. Some additional photos. This is the section of Mickelson Drive that will be um, paved. This is at the very uh, northwest corner of the northernmost entrance into Western Dakota Tech. And then you can see um, now the mobile homes that um, are already uh, on site in the new mobile home park. This is a picture of Diamond Ridge um, and all the single family homes that are already constructed. And one of the benefits with this particular TIF, at the end of the 2020 tax year, none of these homes had a value on them. So immediately we're gonna have um, I counted 53 structural homes that now will be included in the new increment. So that was a bonus. Here is the location of one of the, uh, of the regional detention pond in phase two. And those power lines, um, that's the actual um, corridor for East Anamosa Street. And here's the uh, booster station uh, line. We currently um, the applicant has it identified at the corner of East Anamosa and East Philadelphia. The city has it identified over by the existing reservoir. But one, uh, again, one of the pieces here is that we've got to have both of those water mains connected along with that booster station to make all of this work. So here is the uh, amortization schedule using um, the dollars and for construction and uh, the incremental revenue. And we do have that paying off in um, about 12, maybe 13 years, depending on the construction. And so another spreadsheet for you. Here are all of the capital costs um, with a comparison of non-TIF funded projects. Currently the construction for phase one is about 23% of the total cost. The construction for phase two is, is about 67% because there are fewer um, items that they're gonna be constructing within phase two with a total of um, about 67% of overall costs for uh, phase two. And then the total is, um, comes out to about 27%. Again, here are, um, is a quick version of all of the costs together. And the pub, public, public, excuse me, and the public improvements that go with it. And the total TIF costs again are 28.8 million. And here is um, another overview of the boundary that we're creating. I did have a couple public comments that came in. There was one property owner um, that has requested um, to be excluded from the boundary. And it's identified there in the red boundary in this particular graphic. It's located at the uh, southeast, southwest corner of Anamosa and Elkvale. His uh, comment was that he already has utilities to this project and he doesn't need to be included. Um, this will be your call if you want this excluded, but generally with a tax increment district, it doesn't impact the property. It only impacts the taxing agencies that um, collect those property taxes. Um, and so then um, there are a couple stipulations that were included in the project plan and I'm gonna highlight them for you that um, the developer provide funding to the city upon approval of this district for the booster station feasibility study. And depending on that study, um, then the booster station funding for the city to design within two months of the study completion. And again, if applicable, after the design is complete, two months um, later, they'll provide construction and construction administration funding. 
And another thing in the project plan, if this booster station isn't feasible within the district, then those particular project plan costs can't be reallocated to any other project cost. That both phase one and phase two water main extensions have to be complete before any TIF funding is reimbursed. And the reason I say that is we've had developers in the past identify project costs and for public improvements and they have not put those public improvements in. So this is, with this particular item, it's really critical that we have, again, both phase one and phase two water main extensions connecting from East Philadelphia over to those lines in East in Elkvale. So this stipulation is really important in my opinion. And that the developer donate all of the easements and right of way for the water mains and then uh, all of the costs associated with transferring the ownership rights that they donate the easements and or lots for the four detention ponds and again the associated costs for transferring those ownership rights and then if you determine it it's necessary to remove that 16.8 acre parcel as requested by the property owner but with that um, the TIF committee did recommend approval on the 18th of November and then staff does um, recommend approval as well with these stipulations Thank you, Patsy. That was a great presentation. Any questions for her, comments on this? Uh, Eric Heikus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Great presentation. There's a nice mix of housing types here. The density is appropriate, I think, for our area the cluster aspect is really lovely too I think um, you've got nice dense areas and clusters mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. could you describe the uh, there's a little bit of mixed-use development in included in this and some industrial could you highlight that really quickly I know you did but there, I see there's a little bit of commercial and in the industrial in the industrial quickly. uses are just off the screen here and um, you have recently approved um, a preliminary subdivision plan uh, for the lots up here in this area. And they are coming forward with final plats on that. There are some commercial uses um, generally identified along Elkvale. You can't really see it with that photo, but. So this piece of property that wants to be excluded is a commercial use and generally these areas um, immediately adjacent to Elkvale are also commercial. Thank you. Uh, I can't help but uh, speculate that the stormwater elements look very park-like in this design. Is that part of the uh, intent there for those to be public parks or are they, are they basically shown as uh, pretty ponds right now? Well, they, they do look like they are very pretty ponds. I'm not sure because there are, these detention ponds are really needed to help address some of the downstream issues that we are currently having, um, not only south of what you see here, but also south of Highway 44. And so these ponds um, will probably be less park-like because of all of the water that they'll, they'll uh, detain here. That's, that's my opinion. <laughs> Not a just graphically, person. it just looks, they look a little parky there. They do. So, yep. Uh, no further questions, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Haven. Who determines the boundaries of the, of the TIF here? I notice, you know, when you look at the boundary on, especially on the south side, there's some, there's some lots that are included and lots that are excluded. Uh, obviously there must be some reason for that so I guess who determines the boundaries for the request well um, the applicant did and um, we had to come back and adjust a couple of the proposals because this particular lot I don't really like let me change that line this particular lot here that you see is a part of several of up here we tried they tried including this piece but it had property here and some down it was it's a very um, non clean lot so we we tried to use um, a boundary that was seemed reasonable to include a couple of these lots north we had to include this piece south 
because you can't have a, a portion of an unplatted balance inside a TIF and a portion outside the TIF. This generally is a drainage lot. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, I, I think it does. I, the public comment uh, by uh, the landowner there on Elkvale, so what effect does that have, I guess, on the proposal? I think you made some comment on his comment. So if we take this particular lot out, what we're going to have is a little strip of Elkvale inside. Uh, so if we take the lot out and go, so it's like this, we still have to have this portion of Elkvale inside the boundary to make that, con that water connection. And so it'll be a little, just a little extra right-of-way piece and it doesn't really make sense to have only that right-of-way inside the boundary because you can't, you can't use TIF funds outside the TIF boundary. So in order to use that right-of-way right there, we have no legal property, you know, tax-paying, tax-generating property inside and adjacent to the boundary right there at Elkville if that piece of property is removed. And there's several landowners in this area. Uh, so have they been uh, part of the process? You say the applicant, but the applicant is applying for properties other than what they would control, I assume. So I had a conversation with the owner of this piece of pro with a representative from that piece of property. Um, this piece of property here is owned by economic development. And so one of, the, one of the issues that economic development faces is the construction or their portion of the construction of that unconstructed Anamosa tree. So as the representative uh, and I discussed, you know, what was going on out here, they'll probably work with economic development to do some kind of land swap or some kind of buyout of this particular, of this area, and then potentially work with that owner as well to purchase that property. Um, but, you know, that's just, that's just a, a discussion that we had, you know, to, to try to get the entire segment of Anamosa constructed as part of this. So following the action this morning by the Planning Commission, what's the next step on this? So um, depending on your approval, if you decide not to create this district, then, then we're done because the Planning Commission has to make a recommendation to create the district. If you decide not to do that, this project is done. They can reapply later with whatever um, they pr their proposal might be. But if it does move forward, we'll get the agreement done and they'll start the construction on the uh, west side generally as phase one. Um, depending on whether or not you take this particular lot out, um, we'll revise that legal description um, in the next uh, cycle of notification. We do have to notify, we do have to publish the notification um, for the council as well. Yeah, council will hear it. Um, th there's a, uh, in our policy, there's a separate hearing which will go to the next council meeting. So this application will be considered by council um, the first January, the first Monday in January. Karen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a few questions, Patsy. <clears throat> the the uh, Anamosa Street that goes from wherever to all the way over to Elkville Road, that's not planned to be paved. It's just to, to get the water lines through there, or is it supposed to be paved to a certain part? The developer, w as, as the developer uh, moves forward with his uh, development plans, they will provide funding for the road construction for the other for the other public improvements necessary because as you know with all uh, platting requirements the developer pays for water sewer storm sewer conduit all of those things and the paving for a three-lane facility 
what we're doing to encourage the completion of the two water lines. Staff supports grading this this um, corridor so that when that platting does come forward, it's not going to cost nearly as much. It'll just be the surfacing really and some um, other utility improvements, but it's really so that we can get those two water lines in. Okay, so currently then you'll have paving up to the de where the developer does his construction, but not from that black area to the east to Elkville, correct? It's so as have the water line in. Yeah. So one of the things that's going to happen in Mickelson, we're going to get this little portion right here paved, and as this section here is already paved. As they plat this property here, they'll pave both sides. Of, they'll pave that piece of Mickelson Drive. After the water lines are in and they start platting um, property on the north and south side of Anamosa Street, then they'll come forward with the surfacing and the other um, utilities that need to go in. I believe they own this portion as well. So once they move forward with this area here, that, that paving will also occur. So this is the piece that may or may not get paved right away, but based on the discussions I had with this prop the, the northern piece with that property owner's representative, um, he's interested in getting the rest of Anamosa Street constructed if he can make um, arrangements with the adjacent property owners. I just see some of this is, is similar to um, the property out in the valley that goes so far and then it just takes so long to get the rest paved and which is how it works. I mean, I understand that. Correct. Okay. Um, let's see. The piece, the person that wants to be removed from the thing, does he have any idea of what he wants to develop? Is that part of it or he just in general just doesn't want to be in there? In general, he just doesn't want to be in the TIF. Okay. That sounds like other people who Correct. don't quite understand TIFs and, and don't want that ha to happen. Okay, and phase one and phase two, to get the water lines in, so anything that would happen on phase one, if they've completed, without the water line, both water lines or all the water lines being constructed, they won't be able to get paid until those water lines are constructed. Is that correct? Correct. Our, our policy right now says that um, if you want to, certify in phases, you can do that. Um, so their proposal is to get everything done generally um, from North Valley Drive to the west completed in phase one. Phase two doesn't come until 24-25. My concern is, you know, they pay this off and this portion over here doesn't ever get completed like we've seen in other TIFs. Right. That is a critical piece, in my opinion, to get everything um, even over on this side of Elkvale, moving forward in a development manner because of the water distribution issues that we have over here. So my proposal, mine alone, is that all of the water lines get constructed as part of, you know, whatever phase they want, but they can't get funding, um, TIF funding reimbursed until the two water lines are in that will encourage them to get those pieces done before they get any reimbursement back. Okay, that's and, and, and part of your proposal. If we approve this with that stipulation, we can do that? Um, I believe we can. Okay, that's, that's the question that I have because I, I agree with you. I, I've seen a lot of tips that don't always fulfill everything or they do, but it might be 10 years down the road or right at the very end of their TIF, 20 years almost. And the purpose of this TIF to me is to get that water line. I mean, that's why the city wants to do it. Correct. Is to get that water line connection. So I, I would I would agree with what you're saying, and I think that's I think that's fair. You know, that's what we're. This is a big, huge project, and I understand the cost of this has got to be enormous for the developer. But I also think this is going to benefit him in the long run, and, and it should benefit us in the long run as citizens. So, exactly. Okay. That's all the questions I have right now. Thanks, Patsy. Mm -hmm. Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, great presentation, Patsy. Appreciate it. 
Eric kind of touched on what I was <clears throat> going to ask, and that was, you know, obviously this is addressing the civil needs of this development, and it's an ambitious development, obviously. You know, my question was, you know, these detention ponds, you know, is there a use for recreation? And my guess is no. You know, primarily these are for function, not uh, recreation. Um, you know, we see more and more, re more and more of these developments coming across uh, this arena, and this is probably not the uh, time for this discussion, but I just worry about the density um, of these of these layouts. You know, there's not many green belts or open spaces. Um, you know, I just worry about Rapid City expanding too fast. Uh, I look at the strain of this water system alone. I mean, a 16-inch main, a 20-inch main, that's a lot of water. That's a big, big main. And I think about the stress that's going to put on our infrastructure along with uh, you know, street traffic, retail traffic, schools, uh, even our recreation outside of town is, is becoming more and more stressed the faster we grow. And uh, I just, I'm a little concerned about how fast these things are, are being pushed through. But I mean, this one, obviously the civil needs are being met. It's a great, it's a, it's a great layout. So I have no issue with that. But just as a comment, I would just like to see more, and Eric can probably back me on this, you know, green belts, broken up spaces, a little more, I guess, measured approach to, you know, allowing healthier and more natural areas for these residents to enjoy. Uh, we are the Black Hills and we do have a tie to the, you know, the, the, the land and, and, and nature. So um, I would just hope that the long range planners and the city government in general would, you know, sort of keep, keep an eye on, on that sort of element respected to this community and, and, and in our culture out here. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Good comment. Uh, Eric Heikus, you're up again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I forgot to ask a, a question. Uh, it's a leading question, I guess. Um, do we have any metric on the amount of this would be considered um, affordable housing? As, as planned, I mean, it looks like a pretty appropriate amount of uh, that. A lot of folks um, look at these tiny homes as affordable um, because, you know, they're smaller, you can get more um, density in there. And then I know that this is for generally targeted for seniors, but, you know, um, the costs of Normally, the cost of a manufactured home is lower than a cost of a structure, a structure built. I know that they're, they're built generally this, with the same standards, but um, because they're smaller, more compact, um, in my opinion, that's where more of the affordable uh, homes will be located with the exception of, you know, potentially some of them on smaller lots, on townhomes, you know. Um, I know that these homes here are generally um, about 150, 175,000. So, um, based on the state's definition of affordability, it's 100,000 less. The state's definition for an affordable home inside a TIF is 250,000 for Rapid City. <laughs> so, you know, depending on the definition that you're looking at, state says that there's a lot of affordable homes in this particular subdivision. It's a lot of mean, as Kelly mentioned. It's a lot of you know, mean level. Uh, I don't have any further questions. Thank you. That answers my question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I remember when this project first came up and also when we were discussing TIFs and uh, I, I was critical of how we handle TIFs and how many we give out. And when this project came up, one of the project, one of the ideas behind this project was uh, because at that time we were discussing heavily uh, affordable housing, <laughs> and what this project did was it did provide that, or it did address it. Let me put it that way. Anyway, uh, as to the tiny homes, uh, the mobile homes that uh, that are in that area as well as the range from 100,000 to 150 is what I remember one of the, the quotes was in, in here. And uh, for, uh, and, and with your stipulation uh, about, uh, it, it seems reasonable and rational 
at this time to go forward with it. Uh, I appreciate your time and effort and, uh, and the thoughts that we're all put into it. Uh, thank you. All right. I don't have any other lights up, so I'm going to take uh, the opportunity. Um, I think the stipulation to complete the water line work, whether it's in one or two phases before reimbursement, is a is a good way to guarantee that the the benefit reaches the city on this one. I just want to be clear, though, that those are under that five-year stipulation of of improvements completed, correct? Correct. Okay. Well, what I would what I would uh, foresee is that as part of the developer's agreement, these stipulations be included, and in that you know we have time to get the lines accepted um, before uh, reimbursement occurs. You know, I know that you know developers are anxious to get their funding so that the the interest costs are much lower and and we agree with that so you know this would be a way to get those two water mains installed and accepted by the city before that five-year timeline of course you know any any project any public improvement project identified here has to be done within that five years and we have added language into our agreements um, most most recently that the city has to accept those as well so that all of the checklist items on any infrastructure are complete and the, the city takes ownership so that you know we ensure that those improvements are done and they're done correctly and we're spending all of those dollars inside that five-year timeline okay and that is it i just want to make i'm imagining everyone the city developer all involved parties are aware when the clock starts so to speak it, so we know when the yes. clock stops okay as soon as as soon as council approves the district on uh, January fourth, that's when the clock starts. Okay. Any other questions or comments on this application? If not, I'd look for a motion. I'll make okay, I, I'll make the motion. That we approve, and I'm not. I don't have the agenda in front of me again. But what, what is the motion to approve the resolutions? So recommend that you would recommend creating the district based on the resolution attached, okay. um, and then also recommend approving the project plan with the stipulations identified before you to go into the agreement. And that would include phase one and phase two. Correct. So, okay, go ahead. I'll just interject. Yeah, go ahead. Karen Patsy laid out possible stipulations that are in front of us and behind us and in your motion please identify if you want number eight the removal of that public comment property owner involved or I, just um, the first my, seven yeah my motion is to approve all these items but um, I don't believe we need to remove that one property owner so so uh, stipulations one through seven correct and can you, are you able to see that? I Is everyone able to see, see it? I just want to make sure that, okay. And Vince seconded that. So the motion on the floor, even after I interrupted so much, uh, by Karen and seconded by Vince is to approve this resolution to create a, a tax increment district and approve a project plan for the East Anamosa Street Water Extension with the seven stipulations, one through seven, listed um, by Patsy. Any discussion on that motion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. All right, I think that brings us to the end of our regular agenda. Any discussions items, staff items today, Vicki? Well, for those of you who have sat up there uh, over the years, you know that this is usually the meeting we bring you Christmas treats. <laughs> and it killed me not to do it this year, but unfortunately with all of 
the pandemic restrictions, we thought it's best to be safe, but put it on the calendar. When this is behind us, we are going to have a celebration and we will bring you treats to make up for all you've missed in the 2020 holidays that we like to uh, bring and share with you. So with that, my apologies, but we do want to wish you and all of your families a very safe and happy holiday. Thank you for what you do. It's greatly appreciated. We don't take you for granted. Just the questions you asked today shows the commitment that you have to the positions that you hold. And uh, we need that and we appreciate it. So thank you. Thanks Vicki and Merry Christmas to all the other folks here. If we don't see you, have a great Christmas. Uh, any planning commission items? All right. Who wants to adjourn? All right, Mike Goller made the motion. Did seconded the motion. I saw him nodding. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. We're adjourned.